Perfect Submission, part two. Well, good morning and welcome to church today as we're on uh, a mini three-part series in the middle of our series on the book of Colossians. And the reason why we're slowing down here to do like a sub-series of the series is because there's some difficult text that we have run into at the end of chapter three, where it's talking about the different relationships and the Christian's instructions on how to operate in different forms of relationship. And uh, as last week, we talked about husbands and wives and how they relate to each other and how the Lord has structured the family. And then today we're on part two of that where it is where the Lord speaks through the Apostle Paul telling children to obey their parents, but for fathers not to embitter their children and be overly harsh. And those just two verses, I'm going to fill you in on a bunch of different parenting, uh, what a child should understand looking at their parents and what a parent should look towards their child according to what the Bible gives us to be able to submit to those who are over us and how to properly lead those that are under us. First and foremost, we must understand that in these few verses at the end of chapter 3 of Colossians, that it says, in the Lord, seven times. And we hear the word, pleasing to the Lord. In other places, like in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, it's also very similar, saying, what pleases the Lord, or in likeness to the leadership of Jesus Christ. So when we see submit, we do not see that as a derogatory term or a, uh, a term that is meant to have the other person dominate you, but simply to yield to the other person's authority or position in the same way that we yield to police officers and we pray that they do their job correctly and justly. We yield to our doctor's advice, or at least we should if they're a good doctor. And so what we're talking about here is how can we have relationships where we are not rebellious, where we're overly independent, and where we're stubborn? Because, by the way, the opposite of submission is to rebel. And that's the problem of the state of humanity is that we have rebelled against our God. We have not submitted to the Savior of our souls. The author and the finisher of our faith we have rebelled against and rejected. And he is the one that gave us life. And it is a blessing to be alive. So for us to reject the life giver is such an affront to God, which is why we need a salvation plan, because we can't save ourselves. And hence why we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by saying in Colossians 3, in the Lord seven times, it is hearkening back to the teachings on Jesus as Jesus taught about leadership in all forms. So Paul's now applying it to different areas of life. Jesus spoke of it in a general sense. He talked to his disciples, his apostles, and he said, Hey guys, you know what? The people of this world, they love to lord their authority over others and, and just to boss them around. But not you. The greatest among you will be the servant of all. In other words, what Jesus is saying is to follow his example of being the servant leader. And when you're the servant leader and you're doing your job well, people will generally like to follow and to yield, aka submit, to your authority. And we also learn that if we want to have a greater impact on people around us, we should not want them to just want to submit to us for the sake of submitting, but that we actually have something beneficial for them, that it's wise for them to yield to you. And we're also told by Jesus that he who is faithful with little will be given much. So we must all start somewhere. We all start as a child. And as we grow into adulthood, we learn how to submit to others where we yield to them and we benefit from their wisdom to a point in time which we can be the one that delivers the wisdom. So for here, I'll just read these two verses, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, and then we'll dig into this a little bit further. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. So this message is really going to be broken down into two main parts, other than just that general teaching I gave on submission and how we should approach scriptures uh, when we come to that phrase in other places. Is one, children, how can I give some instruction from the Bible to help you to relate to your parents? And then two, parents, how can you relate to your children? So let's jump from children to the parents. One thing that a child must know, no matter how old they get, and yes, I'm still a child, still got my mom, and uh, is to respect and honor them because for you to be alive, for anyone to be alive, that's everybody, uh, to be a good child is to recognize that I did not form myself. I did not pay for my upbringing. I was raised and there was a lot, a lot of input that others put in for me to get this far. So I must respect my parents, which is why even that made God's top 10 uh, on to honor your mother and your father. And the way we understand honoring your mother and your father is by obedience and respect. 
And uh, so that as we do that and try to yield to them, a child may not always agree with everything a parent does, but if it's not bad, if it's something that's just you disagree with, it's good for us to exercise our ability to even to submit the things that we think we might know a little bit better. And, uh, and the reason is, is that that helps us to become teachable. If we are unyielding to submit to anybody unless it gets our way, we're going to be a pretty horrible people. So we must learn to get along with imperfect people. And yes, parents are imperfect. But as long as it's not a bad order, and that we just simply obey because we respect and honor what they've gone through. Maybe they know something we don't. Maybe their way actually is the better way. Maybe it isn't. Well, we'll learn and grow in wisdom together and figure it out. Because a great price has been paid for anybody to be alive and to be raised in this world today. So not only in the Ten Commandments are we told to honor our fathers and our mothers, but it's, we're also reminded in Ephesians chapter 6 that uh, it's the first promise, the first commandment that comes with a promise. And that promise is that you will live long in the land the Lord is going to give you. The Lord is pleased when we honor parents because he likes it that we recognize when somebody has invested in us. Anybody can know where somebody's holding them back. Anybody can look and see whether it's your boss, whether it's a spouse, or whether whoever you think it is, or your parents holding you back, otherwise you could achieve a greater good. Anybody can always see what is blocking them from attaining their future, but we don't give the proper respect to how we even got this far in the first place. And it should be a big part of our lives because it says, as unto the Lord, and as we do this, and as we regard our Lord, we regard that he is the ultimate giver, the ultimate parent, the one who created life. And that came down through the ages for our turn to be born, our turn to be privileged to be alive. And to even stop for a second to realize just how privileged it is for us to even exist, is that when you look up at the total gene code of uh, humanity, and if you were to take all the possibilities, uh, you know what a double helix is, DNA, all those come from mom and dad, and then they can meet up in various forms. Well, with all of the possibilities in the human genome, that means that there are uh, literally trillions of different possibilities of human beings. Well, there's 8 billion people on the planet today, and scarcely more than that that have existed in the past. It's kind of interesting to think that the people who are alive today uh, compromise almost half of all humans that have ever lived, uh, or thereabouts. But nonetheless, if there are many times more than that possibilities, but didn't happen, then what ends up happening is this, to realize that you're actually a very rare commodity. You are uh, very unique, and that means that there's more people that could exist that never will exist. So the fact that you're alive, it's, inc it's incredible, uh, of all the possibilities that could have been. So we thank the Lord for who we are, no matter what difficulties we may have on this earth. It's a blessing to be alive. It is a blessing to be a part of his family. And so I must turn back and look back and thank God for the people who got me this far. Think of it, if people didn't procreate, uh, that's kind of what the whole mission was, be fruitful and multiply. If humanity stopped that for just one generation, we'd be gone, it'd be over with. So the fact that people have a, put in a great price to make sure that there's a blessing going into the future. If everybody stopped having babies in 100 years, we'd all be toast. The world would be over. And that's the whole point of what Christ came. He wanted a big family. So he said, be fruitful and multiply. So not only is having children obeying God's command, but then being children that are thankful for being here, thankful for being included in God's plan, thankful for being alive, that we give honor and respect to those through whom we came. Because if they'd stopped, we'd all be done. So to also understand that we have been invested in, an investment is like planting a seed. You're expecting to get something out of the return. Now, good parents expect you to get the investment out of what they've invested in you. Because I'll tell you this, children, anybody who, you're, you're, particularly your father, which is in view here as the disciplinarian, your father is one of the only people in this entire world that want to see you do better than them. And the way that they go about disciplining is usually related to they know you well because you do carry a lot of their DNA. They know what they acted like when you acted like that, and they know what correction they could have had to become better. And fathers, even half-decent bad dads, still want their children to do better than they did. And that is the greatest joy of a father is to invest in a child and to see them expand and go further than their own. That is really what it's about. And it's a great joy and an honor to see a child to grow up and to achieve even more. And then you pay it forward. You know, good parents don't look to be repaid from their children and, uh, in any type of monetary form. But with all that is invested, and it's a lot more than you may think, it is something that is worthy 
of respect, even when they don't do it so well. In Hebrews, we're told that uh, our earthly fathers, they discipline us as they see best, uh, though imperfect. We also learn in that that our God is perfect and he is also trying to raise us. So this is why it's important for us to also to yield to our Father, to be a good child of God, is to realize that God has also invested spiritual gifts in us and he expects us to bear fruit. So that means he expects a return, which also means that he expects us to, uh, to grow up in our faith, which is why doing diligent Bible study so that we can learn how to be better sons and daughters of the King in heaven is going to be a big part of our Christian life here on the earth. And that's how we honor God is by yielding to him in the ways that he has taught us how to live and to honor the wisdom that he's given us in the scriptures and through many of the great leaders that we have in our churches and through mom and dad. But I want to read to you from uh, the first century out of Alexandria was a guy named uh, Philo and he had taught extensively. He's a Jew. So this is a Jewish perspective in the first century. So this would have been like the, the general culture uh, in the area that Paul is also speaking into on the matter. And he writes this. Parents have not only been given the right of exercising authority over their children, but the power of a master. For parents pay out of the sum many times the value of a slave for their children. Uh, they also invest in nurses, tutors, teachers, in addition to the cost of their clothes, food and care and sickness and in health from their earliest years until they are full grown. Given all these considerations, children who honor their parents do nothing deserving of praise, since even one of those items mentioned in itself is quite sufficient call to show a deep respect. On the contrary, they deserve blame, sharp reprimand, and extreme punishment on those who do not respect them as seniors, nor listen to them as instructors, nor feel the duty of repaying them as benefactors, nor obey them as rulers, nor fear them as masters. Therefore, Honor your father and your mother next to God. He, Moses says in Exodus 20, verse 12, for parents have a little thought for their own personal interests and find the fulfillment and happiness and the high excellence of their children. And to gain this, the children will be willing to listen to their instructions and to obey them in everything that is just and profitable. For the true father will give no instruction to his son that is foreign to virtue. So you can see this Jew in the first century was a little bit harsh, but he's recognizing the investment that goes in. So he even compares it to buying a slave. So buying a slave, uh, which was very different than what we understand of slavery and history in North America, but nonetheless, you could buy a laborer uh, for life as, a sense of, as it was. And that uh, to think of having a child who does not end up paying you back monetarily, the investment that goes in, at least when you buy a slave, you get something in return. But it's saying here that there's something that God puts in the heart of a mother and a father to want to invest in the next generation. Because God did say, be fruitful and multiply. And we should enjoy and want to do that. And we should take great delight when we try to virtuously raise children. And so with that, that's why it's important for, with all that has been done, nobody has done more for a child than the parents. And we must honor and respect that. Maybe not quite as harsh as, as Philo there, because obviously the Lord is, through the Apostle Paul, trying to teach them to be servant leaders and not to be harsh with their children, because that's what we're getting on to next. And, but it's just really pointing out the cost that is paid and saying that, that uh, you deserve any one of those things that was mentioned to deserve to give respect to the person who gave that to you. It's how we got to where we are in this life. And so with that, we honor God uh, for bringing us into this creation, and we thank God that he's given us parents uh, in all that they have done, the good, bad, and whatever, that we're thankful that we have made it this far. And that may, with the help of the Lord, we grow continually further, and then to be able to be fruitful and multiply and put Christians into the next generation that are well-raised by us and invested by us. So that's how we can be good children in this world. So that, that never ends. So when someone's full-grown, of course, they're on their own and can do their own thing. But still, nonetheless, your parents are still continuing to gain in wisdom. Yes, you might have your own household and your own free to go do so, but still remember the cost that came both in body and in labor and in wisdom for us to be continually raised. So we always, even though we're investing in the next generation, we're always looking after mom and dad well into their senior years until it's time for them to go be with the Lord. So next we move on to fathers. Don't discourage your children because the whole point is to raise a child to become a formidable influence in this world for God and to continue on the be fruitful and multiply and go and make disciples of all nations. 
So to keep that going, we're supposed to raise our children in virtue. And when we're overly harsh, we can end up discouraging them. And that is the opposite of what we want. We want them to be courageous, not discouraged. We don't want to be so hard on them that they break. But we, need, we know we need to give the tough love to be able to push them to be able to realize their full uh, talent and, and abilities, but don't break them. This is often a very difficult thing to balance as a parent, is to know when do you push and when don't you push. So even again in the first century, uh, the, the Romans, this was I'm about to read next, so first we heard from a first century Jew, now we're going to hear from a first century uh, Roman on this subject of even giving some restraints to fathers. So Plutarch says this, he tells fathers to exercise restraint and sensitivity. Plutarch advises, I don't think that fathers should be utterly harsh and austere in their nature, but they should in many cases concede some shortcomings to the younger person and remind themselves that they too were once young. So the advice there from that Roman is very, uh, very much in line with what the Apostle Paul says, is don't be too harsh. So even this Roman says, you got to accept some shortcomings. And it's in fact sometimes some of our shortcomings that were overlooked by our parents end up helping to be the best teaching tool for us to figure it out on our own. So this is why we need to search the scriptures on parenting to see how can we become a better parent so that we can help to know when do I push and when do I yield? How do I raise this child to be uh, great in the Lord? Because all this says to be in the Lord. How can I be the servant leader? How can I be, uh, you know, give the right advice at the right time or to find the best advice for my child at that point in time? Consider this as well. Sometimes one of the reasons why parents get too harsh is because a point in life comes where a child will start to reason on their own, usually in the teen years, where they start to push back on ideas. Now remember, this is not necessarily trying to be rebellious, but trying to figure it out. And maybe what appears to be rebellion is someone to think they have a better way and they're just trying to think it out. And they're trying to experiment so they can learn for themselves. And uh, so I encourage you with this is to help them to walk it out. Be willing to have deep and weird conversations with your kids. But also very important parents, I need to tell you this, you need to be involved in a Christian community because by and large in the adolescent years, you need to just have a way of just throwing your wisdom out the window. Uh, it's not inherent in everyone, but it is a dominant feature in adolescence. You did it when you were young. Remember, Plutarch says to remember you two were once like that. And yes, we were. So let's give grace. Let's get other people. But you know what they will do is they'll listen to other people. It's amazing how my children's friends, they can come to my house and anything I say, it's like they pick it up like it's wisdom from, you know, Socrates. And then yet when uh, sometimes it's my own kids and giving instructions to do some chores around the house, there's a lot more pushback. Or if they're trying to do something, I'm like, that's not going to work the way you think it is. They get, I get pushback. But yet we have a tendency to listen to others. So this is why it's important to be a part of a Christian community. You need to be a part of a Christian community so that we are raising your kids, that you have other voices that are in agreement with yours, that have a different level of patience and a different uh, perspective to help that child to realize that they are walking in the true way and they'll remain in it. Next, I want to give uh, another thing that just kind of came apparent to me in the last little while. Now, I've kind of always known it, but it made me think about this whole, like, raising your kid in the community, is you've often heard me say that I didn't grow up in the faith, and that uh, I considered myself an atheist until I was 17 when I came to the Lord, after a short, brief period of coming to a youth group, to which I had not gone to church before. But yet, when I first went to church, my parents, very shortly after, started coming to that same church. And what I thought they were doing was giving their life to the Lord. They were actually coming back to their faith. And they didn't even really see it as much of a gap in their faith, that uh, they had grown up in the church, they had made professions of faith themselves when they were in their teenage years, but then they got busy having babies and growing a business and having life that we just never went to church. But guess what? What to them seemed like just a few short years was my whole recollected memory. So for me, this gap was there. And I'm like thinking, I'm an atheist. And my parents at the beginning, when I first said that, they were shocked. They go, no, we've been Christians all along. I'm um, like, so be careful. What you might think is a short absence from church life, because you're busy. You know, life's busy. Life's tough. But don't let your kid think that there isn't a God in heaven that loves them. And so I, I just had an encouragement out of my own life there is to be very thoughtful about how you're raising a child. You're going to be letting loose a soul onto this world who is hopefully going to procreate and continue on the lineage of the godly people of Jesus Christ. 
So let us make sure that as we parent, that as we parent our children, we give them the best opportunities possible. That means we look after their health. We look after, uh, get other good voices around them. And then you be a good voice to somebody else, a parent who might be struggling in their relation with the teenagers. And so I just want to encourage you that. Don't bitter. Learn and pray. When do you push and when don't you? See, if we're going to follow Jesus and his example of teaching and leading, you'll need to find a couple things uh, that you'll find common amongst Jesus. Because you might be thinking, wait a minute, Jesus was tough with some people, but he's very gentle with others. So what were some of the defining characteristics of that? Well, one, Jesus was most difficult to those who were stubborn, hard-hearted, and that knew better. Usually the ruling class who knew the scriptures and that Jesus would talk very bluntly to them, A, because they could handle it, because that's who they were in life. They could handle the hard talk. And B, he needed to try to get through to them. And often the people that he was gracious to were the ones that didn't really know better, but were still messing up in real massive ways. And he was encouraged, so he used uh, so a harsh teaching or a blunt teaching to try to correct the stinking thinking of the religious elite. And then he used grace, but truth. He kept saying to these people who were doing wrong, you know, go and sin no more. And when his disciples... He had some teenager years with his disciples where they had a lack of faith. And he'd often say, oh man, how much am I going to have to put up with you guys? I've already told you this a bunch of times. You should be having more faith than this by now. And uh, so he, even Jesus got frustrated as he was discipling his people. And so I just want to encourage you in that is to wonder like, you know, when do I give grace? When is love going to be what helps straighten this person out and uh, an act of affection? And when is a sharp rebuke going to be what fixes it? This is where prayer over every circumstance. Try not to make a decision on the moment. It is, if you have a, a corrective issue to take with a, a youngster, go and pray about it first where possible and pray that the Lord may lead you. And as you learn the scriptures and as you learn Jesus' leadership style and his gracious parenting style, his servant leadership, then we will start to impute that onto us. That's why we put such focus on scripture because it is the words of life that Jesus has given us. He is the word of God. And so may we be able to dive into this to honor our parents, even those who are silver uh, and maybe uh, in their elder years. And may we, uh, the children who are out there, try to honor and respect your parents because, you know what, in body and in deed, it took a lot to get you to where you are. It's not to make you feel guilty, but it's to make you feel appreciative. Say, mom and dad have really worked hard. It's said in Canada that it takes hundreds of thousands of dollars for parents to raise their children. Uh, out to adulthood. I would argue that it's much more than that because that doesn't necessarily take into account the things that are paid for by our taxes, uh, like going to school. In Nova Scotia, the average uh, tuition cost for a public school, if you take the Department of Education's budget, and including former pensions and things like that, all the costs that go to our education system, and you divide that up into the classroom of how many students are there, it's approximately $16,000 a year. So students, did you realize that taxpayers, which means your mom and dad are one of them, uh, or some of them, that you're being invested in $16,000 a year by the collective of the moms and dads who are taxpayers. On top of that, thousands of dollars a year is spent on your health care. So before we even get into food and housing and all your clothing and school supplies and things like that, it is really interesting to know how much has been invested in us from the time that we are born to the time that we are set free onto the world. Again, not to make anybody feel guilty, because it's a blessing to be alive. It's not a guilty thing to be alive, but it is the thing to do is to appreciate, respect, and obey. Now, we know if it's an unrighteous order, we can disobey in the Lord, but be very careful with that and just try to honor your parents. And you know what? That The more you uh, parents try to not embitter their children, but to raise them and to love them and to pray about how each interaction and if you get the children involved with other adults, and if you uh, have children who are respectful of their parents, I got to tell you, the peace that will come over your household, over your church, will be so sweet that you are going to be growing giants into this world. And we look forward to seeing what these youngsters are going to do going forward. And they will keep that cycle going of respect and honor, and that every need will be met within a church and within a family. And I think it would be wonderful if we could all live like that every day. And so in all things, we need to realize that we were raised to life. We were raised to live victoriously with Jesus Christ, that he has invested so much in us that he wants to see us do well, and he wants to see us do well with our children, and he wants to see children do well with their parents. And as we continue to be uh, the salt and light in this world, 
that many others will come to faith because of our uh, desire to love one another, to submit to each other where it is uh, profitable to do so, and that as we do it, we keep remembering to have the gospel on our lips. Humanity messed up God's perfect creation, and God could have left it that way, but he did not. He saw the children that he created and had compassion on us, and he offered us a way out through his son, who died on the cross, rose three days later to prove he had the power over life and death. And he offered that if we would trust in him for salvation, that he would indeed save us and we would be bound for heaven, but that he would also give us times of refreshing now, instruction in the word and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and as we go about doing that life and sharing that gospel message, that God has fixed humanity, been the good parent, and fixed humanity out of his own initiative, and that to set his people free. And so as we seek to live uh, the life that Jesus gave us, we're going to go out there and have the way of Christ, as we're learning in this book of Colossians. That he has taught us, he is the truth, he's the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he, he truly is. He's taught us how to live, and we're going to have a great time doing life here together. If you have yet to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to do so. And it's simply an acknowledgement to say, Lord, please forgive me for the wrongs that I have done. I now trust you as my Lord and Savior. I now trust you as, for my salvation, and I want to follow you. Please help me. And then get connected with a local church. So if you're watching this from afar, I'd encourage you to find a Bible-believing church near you. Give me a call if you don't know how to find one, and I'll help you out there. And, uh, but if you're in the city here, we encourage you to come on in, and let's do life together. Let us have the way of Jesus Christ together, and watch him work victoriously in all of our lives. Well, thank you for tuning in to church. God bless you. Have a great day. Let's do something together. Life is better in community. So let me encourage you to reach out to us via the Connect card that you'll see in the description at the bottom of this video. That's your opportunity to just say hi. Let us know you're watching. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Or maybe you have some questions about faith, about our church, um, or about life in general. We're here to help you and we're happy to do so. I'd also like to thank those who are faithfully giving. I can't express my thanks enough. We're able to continue ministry in our community and abroad um, so wonderfully because of your faithfulness of giving the Lord's tithes and your offerings. So to go above and beyond his tithes is just incredible. And so for those of you who uh, wanna come and visit us, please know that our service is a gift to you. We never ask for anything uh, as, from our guests. As a Christian, it is my act of worship to give to the Lord. And each one of us Christians uh, believe that. So if you wanna come check us out, there's no pressure. Just come on over. Uh, if you did wanna give, we have simple ways. Give at regalchurch.com for your e-transfer, no password required. You can drop it in the offering plate on Sundays, or you can drop through the to the office um, through the week. Just pop in, say hello, and uh, let us know who you are, and uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, we can also set up automatic deposit. We'll just send you the simple form, and you fill it out and send it back, and it's good to go. So thanks for your time, and God bless you. Thank you.